One thing that really seems to help students in fostering creativity is limitations, um, which sounds strange if you think of creativity as boundless and open kind of thinking. Um, but if you think about the analogy of the writer sitting in front of a blank page, it makes a lot of sense that too much freedom can be paralyzing. Um, on the other hand, if you take that analogy a little bit further and you imagine an editor giving that writer an entire outline of the story, then there's no space at all for the writer's unique vision. What's really needed is some balance of both limitation and freedom for individual expression to emerge. The teachers that we interviewed um, used two different types of limitations to foster creativity. Um, the first type really focused on creative process and took students' attention off of the final product. Um, we saw with Allison Ricker um, her use of constraint exercises to um, help her students let go of the inner critic or thinking about the teacher as judging their work um, so that they could really play and have fun with ideas and see new directions emerge. Specifically, one way she would do this is through having her students write a draft of their story um, completely without any words containing the letter A. And this obviously couldn't be a final draft, so it really helped them kind of free them up and come out with some new interesting ideas. The second type of limitations we saw were more product oriented because it's great to play with ideas and have fun, but in the real world, the, the final product matters. Matt Levy teaches students in his editing class to use the limitations that are inherent in film to come up with a piece that's theirs and that's unique. While they're given a piece of footage that's kind of fixed and static, that, they, that there are a million different ways that they can cut it and arrange it. Susan Schwabacher teaches her um, interior architecture design students that they really need to adapt their creative impulses to the needs of a real client so that it's not just enough to draw something beautiful and imaginative on paper but that it needs to be something that can be um, that can fit within building code and actually be built um, but this doesn't seem to be a hindrance to students in fact it tends to inspire them to go further and figure out how they can bring that idea into the real world. Peter Schifrin uses a rubric with his sculpture students and they say that knowing exactly what to expect really frees them up to be creative. This is something that was echoed also in a student survey we did about rubrics and um, only a tiny minority of, of students seemed to say that they felt somewhat boxed in by rubrics. Um, I think the difference may lie in the collaborative way in which Peter introduces his rubric. Um, he directly elicits from students the criteria of what it is that makes sculpture good. Eliciting the criteria from the students really helps them see the value in it, and so they're really buying in to this tool. I think another reason why his rubric is so effective in terms of inducing student creativity is that one of the criteria is actually personal expression. So it's not, they see that, that their own voice is not only valued, but it's essential. Whether constraints are inherent in a real world project or contrived by a teacher, I think um, what's clear is that it's really important to balance both freedom and limitation so that you're helping students generate ideas and also come up with a quality outcome.